I need to talk to you today about the genocide that's happening in front of our eyes in Gaza and how it lays bare the still prevailing and relentless racism in Western society. Uh, racism that I didn't see until about a year ago, at least not to this extent, but that by now is so obvious and blatant, but it must be pointed out. And I just need to emphasize that after a year of this onslaught of most horrendous violence, deadly and, and, and psychologically against Gaza, and a open air prison, a, a, uh, a ghetto, a ghetto in which people are incarcerated and being incinerated on a daily basis, that this topic is so emotionally, emotionally disturbing. It is so deeply hurtful because the pictures we are seeing every single day are horrendous. And they're brought to us by the bravest of uh, journalists that still are alive and working in Gaza, like Sa uh, Saleh al Jafarawi, who uh, a week ago or ten days ago brought us these, showed us these pictures of people burning alive in hospital tents uh, with IV drips still attached to their arms. These these are horrific pictures, and this man has been documenting this for more than a year and has been screaming at the top of his lungs for help and and for 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 a, a for humanity and it is not it is not happening still the 2000 pound bombs supplied by the united states to israel are dropping on the gaza strip every single day even just today if you open up google news if you op if if you just look if you just google gaza you read every single day israeli attack gaza's beit lahia ki uh, kills at least 73 there's scores of people dying in Gaza on a daily basis, and it is still being excused in the West with a legitimate reaction of Israel to defend itself. In order to defend Israel, all of these deaths are being excused, and I, we need to look at the justification for that and the mindset in order to explain how that much um how that much cruelty is not just being perpetrated by the direct implementers of the genocide which is the uh, the Israel's um defense forces the IDF and the D is, is is an absolute sham of course but the 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 implementation and the support this is a political a genocide is a political act of groups of a group of people or groups of people against others and it, it it's it presupposes a a very huge asymmetry in force in power and not just military power also narrative power to set a framing around a situation that then makes it possible for the genocider to victimize and to kill and to rape and to get rid of the genocide while still feeling morally superior. This is very important because you wouldn't commit a genocide if you had moral doubts about it. And the, the, the level of atrocities and the level of dying at this point is so large that to me, it's, I need a way to explain how it is that, that large groups inside Europe and North America still do not see behind this. And there are groups who do, the student protests that we have seen, that, 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 that tried to, to speak out of, about this and that were cracked down on. We've, we have very brave journalists in the West. We have very brave Jewish uh, uh, intellectuals and 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 journalists who who work on this day and night. Aaron Mate, um, uh, Max Blumenthal, Aaron Mate's father, Gabor Mate, who speaks about this all the time. We've got uh, we've got many people who are not on board with this, but we have too big a group that is that is still fine, and this still fine even in the face of. 
uh, official reports here from the Lancet, I mean, official reports, sorry, official research, I want to, want to say. The Lancet is probably the most important medical journal in the world, academic medical journal, that wrote about uh, in July, so about three months ago, about what the death toll in Gaza, sh what we should think about that. Because on the one hand, they write that uh, as of June 19th, we had 37,396 people officially confirmed dead um, by the, uh, the health authorities of Hamas in Gaza. Um, and although these numbers are uh, disputed by the Israelis, these, this is the number that, it is, that has been more or less officially recognized by the US and the international community, including the UN and the WHO, as a reliable figure. However, this report also says, the report, sorry, this research also says clearly that uh, in, in uh, international armed conflicts, in wars, you have a, a much larger number of people dying from uh, from indirect and sometimes also direct causes that are unknown until the moment uh, when you uh, uh, until that moment. And they this Lancet study here sets the number of people who have probably died in the Gaza Strip uh, somewhere at uh, one hundred and eighty thousand, calling it a. Uh, a uh, um, conservative estimate. Um, trying to find this uh, here right um, right now, but the the number they are they are estimating as of July of people who died is one hundred eighty thousand by a medical journal, and probably maybe that number is even larger. I mean, by now we are we are in the realm of. Of, of probably of probably 10% of the people of the Gaza Strip having died and the or or, or dying as we speak and the uh, and just to remind you the Gaza Strip is a is a tiny plot of land um in the in the uh, it's and it's hermetically is sealed off that there is no getting out of the Gaza Strip. These the people who are in here are trapped, and they have been going back and forth from north to south, and they, and have been slaughtered. The Israeli narrative and the Western narrative still is that this is unfortunate, but it is actually the mistake of Hamas, and uh, all of these deaths are at the hands of Hamas. The Israelis are nothing but the. Uh, about uh, about the, imp the those who implement this, but and I will I, we need to talk about this. We need to talk about this mindset and come back to it because the whole justification now for this genocide is the thousand two hundred people who were killed in uh, on October seventh, twenty twenty three. Right now, a bit more than a year ago, and the racism that comes with this narrative is very well captured and the whole problem of the racism is well captured actually in a Fox News report on October 7th in which they interviewed a um, Jewish American uh, journalist and activist Barry Weiss and we need to look at that so the report starts with a with a uh, 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 cut together of different scenes of October seventh, and the focus on this, on the horrific suffering, the real, the very real suffering of the people who were attacked and died on that day. The report, of course, leaves out that a good number of these people also uh, died uh, due to, uh, to the, due to Israel's um, the attempt to to fire at all, everything and anything that moved in these areas. And it also leaves out that out of these 2,200, at least 350 uh, people were actually active IDF soldiers, so not civilians. But nevertheless, nevertheless, I mean, the people who died on October 7th, um, they, they are victims too, right? But the focus, setting the focus solemnly on this one, is of course already part of the racism that comes through. And I, I will play this now to you. Uh, and we will need to talk about the framing that is being applied by the, by the anchor and Barry Weiss on this subject. This war can come to an end now. All that has to happen is for Hamas to surrender, lay down its arms and release all the hostages. But if they don't, we will fight until we achieve victory. Total victory.
an amazing package put together by our team here at America's News, and we thank them for that. Let's bring in Barry Weiss. She's the editor of the Free Press. Uh, she has become a friend, and it's an honor to have you here because your work at the Free Press, as well as the Call Me Back podcast, and I would say that our coverage here at Fox News has really helped um, not only crystallize what happened on October 7th, the day, but the aftermath of it. And your reflections this morning would be welcome. We have a little bit of time, so you don't have to rush. Well, Dana, first of all, thank you for everything that you've done. And, and let's just stop here for a second and just realize that these are two women on TV on the same side of, the, of their opinion spectrum on what happened, and they thank each other for wonderful journalistic coverage, for doing something that they say is important in order to set the agenda right. This, this is such a, it, it doesn't even occur to them that it shows how, how much in bed this, this um, narrative making is with the popular uh, mainstream media. Uh, even the uh, especially conservative media in the U.S. In, in in this case, I mean, they thank each other and they think this is a this is this is not revealing in the sense how they how they spin a narrative, right? And now let's continue with with it and analyze what it means for these two white people in the U.S. to talk about what happened in. West Asia in the Middle East, right? And, and how they frame the situation in the Middle East. Everything that you've done on this show over the past transformative year, I think it's been a year of revelations. You know, if you think back to the main comparison that I reached for and that so many other people reached for on October 7th, 2023, the obvious comparison, of course, was to 9-11. You know, liberal democracy is attacked by a group of jihadi terrorists who butcher and maim and murder and, and slaughter, and in the case of Israel, so raped. Rape. Um, the difference, of course, was in the aftermath. On September 12, 2001, it would have been impossible to imagine young people crowding the cities across the West, including here in America, waving the flags of Hamas and Hezbollah and shouting glory to the martyrs and globalize the intifada. It would have been absolutely unthinkable. And everyone would have responded to that with shock and horror. But what has happened on October 8th, 2023, and every single day since then, including today, when the streets of this city are going to be flooded, and this is an allusion to the Al-Aqsa flood, which is what Hamas called the attacks of October 7th, 2023, to flood the city to celebrate what happened on this day. Mm -hmm. And so the- And this is, it is so important that the entire the the entire framing of the situation is of course not only it starts with october 7th because it leaves out everything that happened until october 6th right um you start with october 7th you focus on this on 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 this event and you you create a you create a a linking to uh, 9-11, right, which was the United States' primary reason to set fire to the Middle East, right, to invade Afghanistan, to invade Iraq, to, uh, to, to invade parts of Syria, to, drump, to, to uh, bomb Libya and, and uh, uh, kill Muammar Gaddafi and, and destroy the social fabric of, of Libya. Um, all of that was justified by 9-11, and 9-11 was used uh, over and over again in order to uh, argue that this foreign intervention is legitimate because you were attacked. So actually, it's only an, a, a method of defense. And we see that happening time and again in Israel now, um, how Israel, even while it has boots on the ground in Gaza, in Palestine, in and has its soldiers are on the Palestinians land, how the framing is still that this is a act of self-defense. And when it comes to Israel, the entire collective West accepts that framing and says like, no, boots on the ground in Gaza, in Palestine, that is self-defense. While at the same time saying Russian soldiers in Ukraine, that is obviously an aggression and an attack. Their self-defense is when you repel an, 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 an external force and then leave it there. But what is now happening is, of course, a counter strike um, that has been going on for one year. And not only that, it's also the 
a systematic extermination of the people on this land. And this, if we just look back, we don't even need to go to 1948. We just need to go to 2018 and 19 to to ask ourselves. I mean, anyone listening to um, to Netanyahu who said all that that needs to happen is to lay down your arms and give us back our uh, uh, our hostages, and I will talk about the hostages in a moment, that framing. Let's just keep in mind that in 2018 and 19, the there was this great uh, march of return that that took place in uh, in the in the occupied uh, in occupied Gaza, and you had a lot of people actually marching back, um, marching to the fence and protesting, uh, protesting. Mostly, mostly uh, 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 non-violently on their side of the fence, and Israel shot something like two hundred people, um, killed two hundred people during this these several month period of protests at the fence, where where these people were protesting on their side of the fence, even just getting close. Médecins um, sans frontières, so uh, uh, Doctors Without Borders, says Israeli soldiers fired bullets at protesters on the assumption that anyone, including people under the age of 18, approaching the fence was a legitimate target. And Doctors Without Borders, um, out of that great march of return, had 4,800 patients um, who were admitted to trauma clinics, um, almost 4,000 surgeries that they performed, and 143,000 uh, physiotherapy sessions that came out of that. And that was for non-violent protest at the border where people, some people burn tires, some people threw stones, but that's the level of, of, of powerlessness of the Palestinians in Gaza. And still 200 people were shot by the Israelis, by snipers um, for just that. Um, and this, this is common knowledge. We, 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 we know that this happened and we know the entire history and we know um, which of the two sides did the shooting and which of the two sides did the majority of the dying. The, the big majority of, of people who died in that area that Israel controls has always been done by the Palestinians Con constantly since '48. The Palestinians have died in much greater numbers and suffered in much greater numbers. Yet, when it comes to the narrative in the, in the general public in the West, what we get is the Barry Weisses of, um, of the West who set an agenda and then frame a, uh, a narrative that to the general public in the West just keeps sinking in as... Uh, the poor Israelis that are under uh, under attack, and then of course anti-Semitism, that that this constant idea that even the slightest form of criticism on Israel's state policies is to be equated immediately with anti-Semitism, that has been the, one of the most brutal weapons that also that that really a lot of people in the West internalize, and that shapes now this racist attitude, and and the attitude is racist because. It presumes, and this is also what she um, what she alludes to here, that how dare how dare people in the United States and in Europe not not accept Israel's suffering and then its counter reaction as on the same level as that of the U.S. And we know that the U.S. then killed millions of people in the Middle East after 9/11. Millions died in in Iraq. Uh, in, uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands in Afghanistan, uh, in Libya, and that this level of violence ensued from 9-11, and she, is, she feels indignation that people argue that Israel doesn't have the right to do that. Israel claims the right to have to cause the same number of deaths and to lay waste to the Middle East, the way the United States did. And if you don't grant that right, then you are the problem. Um, and this this is fascinating that the that the discourse is among equality of white people, the equality in the right to killing, and we've seen this now over the last year with Israel even discussing uh, internally whether the Israelis should have the right to rape Palestinians. Right? Uh, they talked about rape here, and but rape is always considered a crime only when committed by 
non-whites against whites, by Arabs against whites. That's real rape. Then the other, the other kind, the other way around, that's not perceived anymore as, uh, um, as, a real, as a real crime. And in the same way, a lot of the Western commentators at the moment uh, do not put the suffering and the death of 180,000 or 40,000 officially, 180,000, probably more, they do not put that on the same level as the 1,200 uh, Israelis who were killed on October 7th. They're, they do not equate that. Um, let's watch a little bit more of Barry Weiss um, it's just to get into that mindset. And then, um, and then we, uh, we wrap it up with the, with the insights about how this racism still the works. The world has changed, not just because this was the largest massacre of Jews since the Holocaust, and it was, not just because it happened inside of the sovereign nation of Israel and made Israelis feel vulnerable in a way that they thought was impossible since the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, but it has transformed, I think, the West, because what we have seen is that we live among people, some of our neighbors, some of our college professors, some of our graduate students, some Broadway producers, I was re-watching some videos, they went out and tore down posters of these innocent people, posters of babies and children and women, some of whom are still being held by Hamas. You would never imagine someone tearing down a poster of a lost cat or a lost dog, and yet here they were tearing down posters of human beings. Mm -hmm. And so, as I sit here on, you know, I can't believe it's been a year, and in cer certain ways it's really felt like one long day, mm. because we're living inside of the aftermath of it. And so it's impossible to sort of offer like an elegy for something that's still unfolding. But as I'm sitting here talking to you, I'm thinking of course of, you know, the victims that you guys just showed on the screen. I'm thinking of the hostages that are still being held there. But I'm also thinking of the war for civilization, because I think it's no more and no less than that. And I think that that is what... This is what it boils down to. It's this framing of a war for civilization. And this, this is internalized by many people in the West that the that the Arabs, that the Palestinians are wild savages, whereas the Israelis are gallant knights on white horses that stand up for civilization itself. Um, and this then explains, I mean, if you internalize this, um, either because you understand it or because you've been fed all of this propaganda for years after year after year, and you internalize this kind of mindset, then you cannot anymore cognitively um, compare the level of violence and you the, the, the propaganda also found ways to make sure that you do not that you're not able to draw equivalence between the two sides because even the way we talk about them you know, of Hamas as a militant uh, terrorist group and the IDF as a as the military of Israel of the as, as the, the legitimate force and um, the, the the hostages the fact that 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 uh, Hamas is holding 200 Israelis hostage in, Palest uh, in, in, in Gaza is being, is being portrayed as the most outrageous thing that has happened in the Middle East. But at the same time, uh, we know that Israel holds about 10,000 Palestinian hostages in its prisons. The, the organization, uh, the Israeli Information Center for Human Rights, uh, Beth Salem, um, that that is that is doing wonderful work of capturing all of that. So again, like also inside Israel, you have you have people who understand that this is wrong, but um, they are a minority. They they report that that as of uh, June 2024, there were 9,440 uh, prisoners, Palestinian prisoners, held in Israelis in Israeli camps, and a lot of them were detained without without um, without judicial processes. They were kidnapped, abducted. Um, we have reports, even in The Guardian, about systematic abuse and torture and people dying um, in, in Israeli captivity without seeing a, with of course, without seeing a judge, like massive, massive abuse. And all of this um, I mean, it's not even it's not even hidden. Israel doesn't try to hide that. They film soldiers film these crimes and and and, and take pictures of it and post it on social media. And again, then the discussion is about whether or not that is uh, uh, that is a right of Israel and part of the right of self defense. Um, but the fact that these people are called prisoners, while the other the other group is called um, 
uh, hostages makes it impossible to draw comparisons, although this is obviously exactly the same. It is un legal, Ill, unlawful taking of, the, of members of the other group. And this is all part of this re deeply, deeply ingrained um, mentality and framework of the West to understand the, the conflict and then give carte blanche uh, uh, to, the, um, to the Israelis for implementing this genocide, which obviously has the, um, has the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the goal of emptying Gaza out and in 10 years have Israeli settlements there and have beautiful beachside uh, resorts um, run by the Israelis in Gaza. Um, <clears throat> It is it is it is utterly clear, but this this framing that is being applied to it that is then this that what creates this racism that even though you have the number thousand two hundred and the the number forty two thousand or one hundred eighty thousand and to a lot of people in the West they will not equate them they will still think that the thousand two hundred Israelis are a much larger tragedy than the 180,000 Palestinians, because they do not perceive them as equal, even though they will tell you, oh, no, of course, it's a tragedy, but, and then there will be a but, and the but will explain why it's not Israel that is responsible for their death, why it is Hamas, why it is the Palestinians themselves, um, why under every school, every mosque, every hospital, Hamas had bunkers and was about to blow up Israel, and so Israel just was forced to strike first. And this narrative is still believed. It's still believed by a lot of people that um, Hamas is so so insanely evil that um, that in order to to eradicate it, it doesn't only use its own people as shields. I mean, but in order to eradicate it, you must kill the shields, and you can kill everybody in the way. And we take the word of the Israelis as absolute truth because doubting what Israel says is already equated with anti uh, equated with anti-Semitism, right? So the the perverse mental system that was created in order to to ingrain this racism not only into the hearts but into the minds of western of the western population has been extremely extremely powerful and it is what makes what is part of what makes this process of extermination of holocaust against the palestinians possible and the it goes together then with other the the, the powerlessness of the other arab states and the fear um, of the of of um, of the U.S. weapons being used against you, the way that we're seeing Lebanon now being punished for uh, resisting as well against the onslaught of the um, of the Israelis, um, and all I want to say um, also to my uh, to all my Muslim friends, uh, to my Arab friends, to my to the people who who suffer so much, who who might be in the West, they might be they might be in the UK, they might be in the US, they might be, uh, the, 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 they might be in, in in Asia, they might be here, and they suffer, they suffer because they identify with this group, they identify with the hurt that this causes the Palestinians, and they are absolutely powerless, and it makes them angry, and I know people who are getting very angry, and getting not only angry at Israel, they get angry at the West, and. All I can say to them is that I'm sorry. This is the worst kind of aftermath or still outgrowth of Western colonialism and the colonial mindset of, and the racist mindset of dominance over others. But we are not all like that. I apologize collectively because, I mean, this is the white, this is, this is white, white people doing this to non-whites and doing it again in this most horrible way that they used to do it, the way that they used to, to exterminate the native population of, of North America, the way they exterminated much of the native population of Australia. And this is another attempt. I hope it's going to be the last one. And I hope, of course, it will not succeed. But it is that mindset and that psychology that is working on the group. Again, we're not all like that. And a lot of good people, a lot of good people in the West just don't know any better. They just they just don't understand that they have been manipulated into, into a racism that they wouldn't even recognize as such. Yet it is it is a societal 
racism um even by people who themselves like would take would take part in any kind of protest for like uh, diversity equity and inclusion and all of the nice sounding words but when it comes to to a real genocide then they don't they don't recognize the racism that they participate in when they focus on the suffering of only one group and not on the suffering of the other when they when the number 1200 to them seems bigger than the than 180000 on the other side when they refuse to believe in such um in such numbers when they just when they when they take wholeheartedly the the framing of the genocider and and claim that the narrative of the genocide is itself a form of racism uh, and that the genocider has the right to commit the crimes that others have committed before and if you don't agree to that then you are a racist this this mental framework is i don't know how we can escape from that other than talk about it and and hope it will go away and i put my hope also on the global south um, who obviously sees through this uh, it's obvious and transparent um to anyone who at this point still thinks, is listening to this and still thinks that what I'm talking about is nonsense and that this has nothing to do with racism, I ask you to do the following thought experiment. Imagine the world was 180 degrees upside down. Imagine on 7th of October it had been uh, Israeli militants who crossed the fence and killed 1,200 Palestinians. And in return, for one year now, the Palestinian self-defense forces um, have hermetically sealed off the, uh, the Israeli lands and have um, had a relentless bombing campaign. And by now, 180,000 Jews in Israel were dead. Imagine for one second that it was 180,000 dead Israelis that came out of the of 1200 dead palestinians and if you still think this would be acceptable if you just inverse everything and still think this is acceptable well then i don't know what's wrong with you but and if you don't think this is acceptable if you if you then think that no 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 this we couldn't have 180000 uh, dead israelis in an in an open air prison camp in a in a large ghetto where they are now being exterminated and burned to death. Um, if you think that is not acceptable, but you think it is acceptable when it happens to the Palestinians, then it's just racism. Then it's just the fact that you don't equate these lives uh, um, with each other and that you think that one group of people is way more precious than the other. Uh, I think that's what's going on, deeply ingrained societal racism that enables this genocide i'm sorry for this topic it, it depresses me very much but we need to be aware of it mm -hmm.